unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Psalms, the 78th Psalm, the 52nd verse. The Bible says he made his own people to go forth like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. And he led them on safely, so that they feared not. But the sea overwhelmed their enemies. But the sea overwhelmed their enemies. He led them as a shepherd would lead his flock. Now, I need to emphasize this even as I share, that the things that I intend to share in this sermon, firstly, are showing you the heart of the shepherd in the leading of his people. And not only in the paths that they should go, but in the times of trial, in the times of adversity, in the times of trouble, in the times of testation, in the time of affliction, in the times of destruction, in the time of pain, in the time of turmoil. God says, this is how I lead them. And the Bible says, and he led them on safely as a shepherd, and they did not have fear, for they feared not, but, and I want you to underline that, the sea overwhelmed the enemies. Let me start this way. Our God is a God of miracles. Our God is a God of signs. Our God is a God of wonders. He's an amazing God. See? And when we are studying Him, to know Him, you remember He wills that all men be saved, so the Bible says, and that they might come to the knowledge of the truth. To the knowledge of the truth. It's beyond just the salvation that God has availed for you. He wants you to transcend beyond that and come to the knowledge of Him. This is eternal life, that we might know the one true God and His only Son, Jesus Christ. Whatever God has done and will do for you, to the end of it is that you may know Him. I will never forget the heart of God. When He heals you of your disease, is that you might know Him. When he got you that job, that you might know him. When he made that breakthrough for you, was that you might know him. When he settled you in marriage, was that you might know him. When he paid your tuition in the time when you did not have anybody come through, was that you may know him. When he bailed you out of trouble at your job, was that you may know him. Whatever he has done is the end that you might know him, that you might understand him a certain way. God is not just done in the usury of the things he has done for us. No, he goes beyond in giving knowledge, imparting wisdom to us in the things that he does for mankind. And for me, one of the most commendable testimonies of Israel, well, there's many things that he did for Israel, but there's nothing for me that is as commendable and memorable like that place where he leads them to the end of the sea and Moses has to part these waters and they walked through. In the book of Psalms, the 106 from the seventh verse, the, the psalmist uh, makes a lamentation that I think uh, would awaken us to the understanding of what I'm trying to emphasize tonight even as I share. He says, Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. Nevertheless, the Bible says he served them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power be known. And he rebuked the Red Sea also. He was dried up, so he led them through the depth as through the wilderness. See, underline that what our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. He's saying, much as I did the miracles that I did in Egypt, much as I afflicted Egypt with plagues, much as I took you through the sea and to dry land as though one going through the wilderness, there was a certain understanding I want you to have. There was a certain understanding 
I wanted you to pick. There was something I wanted you to learn in the things that I have done for you. The question is that when God does miracles, signs and wonders for us, do we know what he is telling us? Do we carry a full understanding of him or just a deep appreciation of God? Oh, God is wonderful. You know, at the last minute this happened. Oh, praise God. That's a good thing. But God, I want you to end in the wonder. He wants you to go beyond the wonder and understand him in the wonder. Every miracle of your life is a wonder. Nothing happens coincidentally. Again, I've said this once, that in Hebrew language, there is no word for coincidence. So you can say, oh yeah, coincidentally I met this individual. Coincidentally this fellow called me. Or coincidentally I went to church. Or coincidentally I met this individual. That is your language. That's your English language. But the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob does not have coincidences. They are only coincidences because you are indifferent to the purpose of that event. You are indifferent to the intention of God concerning that event. You are indifferent to the true and full interpretation of that account at that hour. So to provide for that indifference, to provide for that ignorance, in English we create the word coincidence, but in the spiritual realm or the spirit realm, there are no such things as coincidences. So everything that happens in your life ought to be able to teach you something. If you don't learn, then you cannot know God as you ought. And so it's not automatic that because you have seen many signs, miracles, and wonders, you have then understood God, or that we justify men or approve men as true workers of God because they have seen or demonstrated too much power before God. The children of Israel walked with clouds over them. They walked with fires before them. They saw waters part. They saw rocks bring forth water, but they never understood God. Only 40 days in the wilderness, the man of God, Moses goes to fellowship with God and he comes back and they've built molten images. They have built other gods. So it's not enough to say that because somebody has seen a miracle, therefore they're going to be tired. No, even with the biggest miracle, it's possible for a man to see a miracle, to see a wonder, to see a sign and still never know God. How does that happen? Because we have not been taught to meditate deeply to contemplate on a thing that is done by God that we might understand the meaning. Because every miracle, every sign, every wonder is a communication from God in some deep way. And if people understood just how much God is able to reveal through the things that he has done in our lives, it's amazing just how much we would learn of God. That's how we know God. Remember, when Ananias goes to Paul, and he's opening his eyes. And God says, for this reason have I revealed or appeared unto thee, that I may make thee a minister and a witness both of the things that you have seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. The full, accurate, perfect minister, the Bible says, is the man who witnesses the things he sees by God and the things in which God appears to him. That's the full minister. So he says, I shall make thee a minister and a witness, both of those things which you have seen, the things I'll show you in vision, and of the things in which I will appear unto thee. When you are in a meeting and a miracle happens, what happens? You celebrate. Oh, we thank God that this person is healed when we're in healing meetings or when we're in crusades or when we're in services and sometimes people throw down clutches and somebody says, oh, you know, my left ear was not hearing or my eye could not see or my heart was healed or whatever happens. Or so people clap, praise God, praise God. But do you learn something? Because if you don't learn something when God's power is at display, then you have not yet matured into impartation. Paul says, how be to them which are mature, we do teach this higher wisdom. It's one of the ways we impart wisdom. The Amplified calls it impartation. He says, yet when we are among the full grown, the spiritually mature Christians who are ripe in understanding, he says, we do impart a higher wisdom, the knowledge of the divine plan previously hidden. But he says, but it is not indeed a wisdom of this present age, or of this present world, which is to come to pass. But it's the wisdom of God, which does not pass away. It's eternal. It is steadfast. It abides forever. So when you are in a meeting and then you see a miracle, do you learn 
So you have a believer who is in this meeting and they're seeing a miracle. Yeah, praise God. Oh, God is amazing. Pray for me too so that I can have that miracle. Okay, Simon the Sorcerer, pray for me too that I might have that power so that when I lay hands on somebody, they too might be filled with the Holy Ghost and he's willing to give his money. And God almost slew that man immediately. She tells the fellow, no, uh, you actually have a bigger problem for he knew he's a girl of bitterness and a bond of iniquity. Pray for yourself that you be restored. What made you think that you will buy the gift of God with money? You see? Because Simon the sorcerer, former sorcerer, did not have the understanding of why men should be filled by the Holy Spirit. In fact, scripture is clear. He had believed, yes, but he had not yet been baptized by the Holy Ghost. He was not yet speaking in tongues. And so he's trying to buy to give what he does not have individually. Think about it. He's trying to purchase to give what he does not have for an experience and the language of understanding, the voice of understanding is putting this man to judgment, weighing him against truth and telling him, look, pray for yourself that nothing worse happens. This is a man who has placed a demand on the thing of God, but immediately the judgments of God have come upon him because he is asking without understanding. Now that is serious. That is serious. So again, we even must be cautious in how we pray. You don't just pray. You must be cautious with understanding. You must pray in understanding. He says, in marriage, be babes. But he says, but in understanding, be ye men. He expects a maturity of understanding. In understanding. Now, when we now go back to our fathers not understanding the wonders of God, it means that God intends to teach us in the things that he does for us. And even when you ever stand in the meeting of a man who is anointed and you see a miracle happen, always ask God, what is my lesson in this? Because it's the beginning of impartation. That is why some people sit under men who do miracles, who do signs and wonders, who do things in the spirit for one, two, three years and these people are not able to do the same things. And then so they assume that it's only for the man of God. The anointing of the New Testament dispensation is not exclusive. It's inclusive for all believers. And these signs shall follow all that believe. They shall cast out devils in my name. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall be healed. They shall handle snakes and poisonous things and those things shall not harm them. They shall raise the dead. Why? Because God is with them, right? You live a life of impartation. If your man of God has opened a blind eye before you, if they've made a bone heal immediately, that was supposed to be your moment of impartation. T.L. Osborne says in his story, he's given, that he went to India and evangelized for so many years. There's one thing he could not see in his life. He never saw miracles. And so distraught, disturbed, he returns back to his home country. And one of those days, he goes in a meeting of one William Branham. It was an open meeting. And in there, one girl had, you know, crossed eyes. And they prayed for this girl. And these crossed eyes came back immediately. And the child saw like a normal person. And T.L. Osborne immediately gets his wife Daisy and goes back to India. And that was the time he started healing the sick. Why? Because more than just the miracle that happened in Branham's meeting, there was an impartation on his spirit because there was an understanding that was impressed on his spirit, an understanding that was imparted on his spirit when he observed the miracle. Remember when they prophesy about the goings of the Christ? The Bible says, and as many wondered, concerning the things that were spoken on the Christ. The Bible says, but Mary kept these things in her heart and pondered on them in her heart. So yes, many held the wonder and stayed in that realm of the wonder. But the Bible says, but Mary pondered on these things in her heart. And when she pondered on these things, no wonder she is the first person to get a miracle out of the Christ. Interestingly, without the timing of God. Because when Jesus Christ stands water into wine. He tells her, woman, knowest thou not that it's not yet my hour to do miracles. According to the plan of heaven, it wasn't God's plan to do a miracle. It wasn't in the way of God to do a miracle. And he says, what have I to do with thee? 
My hour has not yet come. My hour for demonstrating power is not yet here. And she turns to the servants and tells them, do as it tells you. They fill these uh, jars with water and out came wine. See, the first miracle of the Christ was not in the timing of the Christ. It was not in the leading of what was in his heart at that hour. He had not planned it. But a woman who knew how to ponder on a thing revealed concerning the person of Christ knew how to get a miracle even out of season. When you know how the miraculous works, when you know how the saving power of God works, miracles will happen in your life consistently and in and out of time. They'll be available for you in the mighty name of Jesus. Shout amen. So, when I study miracles, when I study wonders, I want that thing which is spoken by God but is not directly implied. Because in there is the churning of the milk for the butter. It's the guarantee for the oil and the anointing to be present for me to understand how to walk in the deliverances of God. Let me give you an example of the same miracle. We have read that the shepherd led them safely and there was no fear with them. And the Bible says, but the sea overwhelmed their enemies. And the moment I read that scripture, somehow my spirit was open to something so beautiful, so beautiful in how the deliverances of God work concerning the things that oppose us, the people that are against us, the devil. You see, the devil. You always read that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall raise a standard for him. Right, and that implies that God always raises a standard against the enemy. And if we should walk in that interpretation, or implication, or there will be other ways, this same scripture, Isaiah 59, 19, would be interpreted. What is this standard? The Hebrew actually translates it this way. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall put him to flight. You see? So when I'm talking about that you are under the protection of God, it doesn't mean that when the enemy comes, okay, when Satan attacks you, God, you know, he garrisons you only and then he puts a guard here and then he puts a guard here and then he puts a wall or a shield for your faith which is all available for you. But that's not the end in the understanding of the deliverances for the saints. No. He is the God who sees this enemy coming at that speed and power in quotes. And he says, if I have to deliver this individual, I'm also going to turn and put this fellow to the same flight in the speed in which he has come even more. He says, they shall come one way. And the Bible says, and he shall scatter them seven ways. God in the deliverances of a believer, he just doesn't want to say, leave my person alone or leave my woman alone. Uh -uh. He wants to do something. That if the enemy came at 200 kilometers for you, God will make 20,000 kilometers and chase the same fellow. That they'll run faster than they ran when they were coming to you. Understand the deliverances of God. Now, listen to this. He says, he led them on safely. They feared not. But the sea overwhelmed their enemies. But the sea overwhelmed their enemies. This is what I saw. It's possible for your enemy to pursue you and pursue you and pursue you and even assume that you've fallen in his snare or that you're where he wants you. If you remember the story very well, that when the children of Israel are led by Moses, they actually went supposedly wrong direction according to Pharaoh. And so the reason why actually Pharaoh is inspired the more to go after them is that they went a wrong direction and they assumed that the wilderness had shut them in. They assumed that these guys were lost because they did not take the usual way to Israel. If this was a usual predictable way and the Egyptians know how to get to Israel back home or into the promised land, wherever they were going, they realized that these guys took another way which was not so. And so in that they think, uh-uh, these guys, as Oda tells us, the land must have entangled them and the wilderness has shut them in. 
See, so he assumed that these fellows were lost. So the enemy has pursued and pursued and pursued. And probably you even make decisions that seem like they are actually shutting you in the more. <laughs> if you've never been there, you will be there one day. So if this someone doesn't make sense to you now, keep it. One day you'll dig it out. So we see the enemy pursue the children of Israel. And as though that's not enough, they appear to the enemy or to the world that they've actually made a wrong decision, even in their way of fleeing. And so Satan in Pharaoh thinks, I think now I have them. So he sends an army, fleet of men in their horses and chariots in the might of that army as we know it. And God says, the devil or the enemy can hold you or frustrate you for that long, but I'm going to create an event. I'm going to stage an event. I'm going to create a circumstance that when you get to it, you will go through it, but it will bury your enemy. I don't know that you got what I just said. God sometimes doesn't need to protect you and put a, you know, a wall for your enemy not to come. No, sometimes he can even let your enemy come as close as he can. That you can see him from afar. That you can smell him. That you can even sense that he's here. And God says, look, uh -uh. what makes me God is that I have a covenant with you that I don't have with those that oppose you. He says, if they shall come against you, I want you to know that they were not sent by me. You understand what I'm saying? So already, even when they're attacking you, the devil is attacking you. He's not under the covenant that you are. When your enemies are coming towards you, they're not under the covenant that you are. A certain lady one time sent me a message and said, my boss, the CEO of uh, the company that I'm at is frustrating me and frustrating me and frustrating me. I feel like I want to quit. So I asked her, is he born again? And she said, no. And I told her, I have fired him. Why? Because this is the covenant. He says it's a glorious thing for God to trouble those that trouble you. And lo and behold, she sends me a message later. The fellow was fired and she was put in the exact place of the one who frustrated her. God, God can flip things any day, anytime through anybody. He can do anything. You never underestimate the power of God. The Bible says promotions come from neither east nor west, but they come from God. And the Bible says he pulls down one and establishes or raises up another. You see? Oh, amazing. Look at the order of the spirit. He putteth down one and setteth up another. Did you hear that? He putteth one down and setteth up another. In other words, it's easy for him to set a man out and put him down and put you up there. That's what exactly happened. God switched positions for this woman. He switched positions for this woman and put her in the place where her enemy was. God can do it. Yes, he can. Yes, he can. Now back to what I'm trying to emphasize here. If your enemy should think that he should pursue you tirelessly, relentlessly, God tells me that he can and he is going to create a situation where only you can go through. But, the Bible says, the sea overwhelmed their enemies. But, the sea overwhelmed, but, the sea overwhelmed their enemies. But, the sea. See, you don't fight a man who can go through the sea. Oh, you have a God. Somebody shout hallelujah. You have a God. You don't fight a person for whom God can part seas for. You don't fight a person for whom God can level valleys for. You don't fight a person for whom God can pull down mountains. You don't fight a person for whom God can make a crooked way straight. He says, he shall make your crooked way straight. And the way is crooked and we see it. And a believer reaches there and God makes it straight for him. Hallelujah, glory to God. And when your enemy comes in, it becomes crooked again. Oh, I wish you understand the wonders of God. What does that mean? It means that you get to a place where the whole world knows that this one, it's impossible. This one, it's hard. This one is complicated. And God makes it so easy for you. And the same person who fought you comes on that road 
and he becomes a maze. And he goes somewhere and he gets lost. And he gets here and then he goes lost. And then he goes here. It's a labyrinth. He gets lost and lost and lost and lost. In the same thing, when you stood, appeared so straight for you. That is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But the sea overwhelmed their enemies. And so that is why you should pity those that are against you. Why? Because you are the anointed of God. The Bible says he is the saving strength of his anointed. Whoa, he is the saving strength. He is their strength. He's the saving strength. Psalm 28 verse 8 of his anointed. He's the saving strength. The Bible says the Lord knoweth how to get his anointed out of trouble. He knows. <laughs> that means there's a knowledge. You can appear like you are in trouble. But he knows how to take you out of trouble. He knows how to take you out. You might be going through the hardest situation and you know your enemy is smiling, your enemy is clapping. Oh, God knows how to take you out. I cannot say the same for them because they are not under that same covenant. But I can boldly say this for you. That God knows how to deliver His anointed. He knows how. And sometimes all we have to do is to lean in that and say, Oh God, I don't know how I got into this trouble. I don't even know how I'm going to come out, but I have to trust that you know how to get me out. Now, if God knows how to take you out of something, it means that if your enemy gets there, he will need a certain knowledge. It will mean that that which pursues you, if it gets there, it will need a certain knowledge. God gets a fire and allows men to burn it seven times more than usual. Oh, who's not going to bow to the image of the king? And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are available. And he that defiles the king, he says he shall be, you know, killed. And he says, get a furnace. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven times more. In fact, the scripture is clear that the fellows who were putting them in there got burned. Hallelujah, glory to God. The fellows who were taking them in there were burned. They did not enter the fire. But it was so hot that by throwing a man there, it will even catch you. And look at how God wants to establish a testimony for his own in the midst of that fire. And these fellows are standing in that thing. A first fellow appears and they appear to be talking. <laughs> Glory to God. So God gets this fire, throws them in there. And when these men get in there, the scriptures are clear. Was a first fellow. And Daniel calls him, who is like the son of God. Jesus gets in the middle of that very fire. And the moment he gets in there, I imagine three guys thrown in. And Jesus appears. Hey, what's up guys? How are you doing? You good? This is in the middle of a furnace burning seven times. Be careful when you fight a believer. Be careful when you set yourself against someone who knows God. Because God will throw him in places that will destroy you. Yet in there, he will be refined. That's such what God is telling us. So we see them speaking to Jesus, the son of God, and they are talking. These guys are talking. If I know Jesus very well, he didn't talk about fire in that furnace. If I know Jesus very well, the God I know. Are you hearing me? Who does not observe lying vanities to forsake the masses of his own? I believe that when he gets into that fire, he starts telling him, by the way, how is ministry? <laughs> Glory to God. They're in the middle of a fire, but God has changed even the conversation because it's not about this thing burning seven times. Let them observe. They have their own lessons to learn when they set themselves against you. But we have a bigger picture here. So you, how is ministry? How are you doing it? Do you know that I'm about to do this? And by the way, position yourselves, yeah? Because when you come out of this, yeah, these guys are going to say this, but, yeah, but this is what I want you to do. Eh? You're going to do this. You're going to do that. This is your ministry, your assignment. By the way, Prophet Elijah, just says hello he's clapping in heaven this and that and that you understand what i'm saying you are in the midst of the hardest situation and god is talking to you not even about that situation because to him that's not important no he knows who you are you're his own are you hearing me and he says you will never let his righteous see corruption he will never let you see corruption if it was to destroy you, he would not lead you there. That's what I'm trying to say. Even if it appears like it's a mistake, 
He has a way. He has a way of taking you through it. But the sea overwhelmed their enemies. It overwhelmed them. So that's why I tell people, when you say that you're going to set yourself against a believer, against a child of God, you better take note. You better take note that they know God. Because if they do, God will create a situation that will bury you and the righteous will stand. God can create events in time. But I tell you as a man of God, this COVID season, it has buried certain people. Not physically, no, certain ministries. And some will never be the same forever. Not all, but some set themselves against the Lord's anointed. God can put events in the world. He can create seasons and times in human history that can wrap the history of all those that oppose you. And one day, even when they thought they had a language or a mouth, they're not able to speak. And he says, look, you will go through it. You will go through it. But the sea will overwhelm them. Now remember, this is the mystery of faith. I want you to understand this wonder. This is the mystery of faith. If you go back in Hebrews 11, the 29th verse, where he speaks about that same experience, if you read from the Amplified Version, he says, by faith they passed through the Red Sea or they crossed the Red Sea as though on dry land, as though on dry land. Now when we get into the conversation of by faith, it even complicates it the more. Because if faith is the substance of things hoped for, and the evidence of things not seen. And God says that by faith, they crossed the Red Sea as on dry ground. He didn't say because it became dry ground. That's the account of Exodus. But this is the account of the New Testament. He says as though on dry land, as though on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do the same thing, they were swallowed by the sea. They were swallowed by the sea. That means the Egyptian tried to do the faith. <laughs> Did somebody understand what I just said? The Egyptian tried to do the faith of the Jew. This is where the challenge is. The Egyptian tried to do the faith of the Jew. He tried to do the principle of a man under a covenant, yet he was not under that very covenant. And what happened? He was swallowed up because it's not just enough to do the principle. There's an end to the principle. In some instances, it would work, but there are instances where even the principle won't work if it's not under the covenant. You see what I'm saying? So not all principles work without the covenant, although I believe that there are certain principles that work even without the covenant. For example, the principle of seed and harvest. If you sow a seed, you'll reap whether you're born again or not. See? But when we're talking about the realms of faith. There are certain realms of faith a man without covenant can never achieve or assume. Why? Because they require the covenant. And this is what God is trying to tell us. They had to believe. And why you see they walk without faith and Exodus speaks of how the children of Israel were not with fear when they walked through this. There's a certain confidence that they had in their souls that God has us. God is with us. And that's how the shepherd leads them all the way. You see? But if you go back to the account, sometimes we abandon the responsibility of the leading because we think that when these events or these affairs happen or these circumstances happen where God has placed for us to go through while our enemies pursue us, sometimes we think we're just going to sit passively and just wait on God. You see? And that's the mistake the children of Israel had done. They cried unto God and waited for the deliverance of God. And God has to rebuke Moses. Tells him, why are you telling these guys to stand here? What would faith want you to do? Faith would tell you, he tells them, tell the people to go forward. Moses said, stand still and we wait and see what God is going to do. God comes in the same story and says, uh -uh. Moses, why are you telling these people to stand still? Don't tell them to stand still. You tell them to move forward. 
tell them to move forward because there is something I want to do. And this movie cannot happen by you standing still and waiting on God. There are certain places wait on God. But there are certain places in faith where if you want to see God, you're not going to stand still. You're going to move something. You're going to apply yourself to something. In fact, if you read Exodus 14, the 15th verse, the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore Christ thou unto me, speak unto the children of Israel that they may go forward. And the next verse says, God tells him, Lift up your rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. I'm not going to divide it for you, Moses. Divide the sea. But God, we are waiting for you to divide it. Ah, oh, you don't get it. The treasure is in you. It's in you that the excellence of power might be of me. I want to do it, but I need your hand in this. I want to do it, but I need your word in this. Such that when they're writing the story, the story says, and when the man says, be healed, the man was healed. Did you get it? God doesn't just want to do a testimony without your participation. He wants your participation. You see, he would have just told Moses, you know what? Walk to the sea. When you walk to the sea, I shall part it. Uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh. That story will be told that they walk to the sea and I parted it. But I want your participation because you're my anointed. Uh -uh. In the modern term, I want you in the movie too. I want you part of this narrative. I want that when they're narrating this victory, your name is included in the miracle I'm going to do. Your ministry spoken about in the miracle and wonder that I'm going to do. Your family is involved in the miracle that I'm going to do. That's what he's trying to tell Moses. Go and walk to that sea. Lift up your road and stretch forth your hand over this sea. I don't want the children of Israel to just say, ah, no, who is Moses? We just walked and got, no, no. I want them to see you raise hands. I want them to see you stretch forth your road. And I want them to see me Part that water because you stretched forth your hand. It says that they will understand that I cannot do this without you. I want to do this with you. Even though I have the ability to do it alone, but I want my mind to understand how I work. I want to do this with your participation. The seas are parted. And the children of Israel walk through. And when they finish, the Bible says in Exodus 14, again, the 26th verse, and the Lord said unto Moses, now they've crossed. The Egyptians are coming. The Lord said unto Moses, again, stretch out your hand over the sea. But I love that God doesn't say, I will divide. He says, you divide the sea, even though it's in his power and it's his power that divides it. But he even gives you the ownership of the miracle. Oh, I've been around people who are still so kind of, you know, you say, let's go heal the sick. Are you the one who heals or it's God who heals? You see, you know, part of those people. <laughs> yeah? Are you the one who heals or it's God who heals? It's God who heals through you. So stop saying that you're the one who heals. Go ye in the world, baptizing them in my name. He says, you shall heal the sick. So does that mean we don't know that it's God who does it through us? But he even wants us to have ownership in the miracle. That's just the way of God. He says, heal the sick. So it's boldness to tell a person, oh, you're sick, yeah, let me come and heal you. <laughs> That's not pride, no. Some people say, oh no, in humility, let me come and then we ask that God be heal you. Because they think that they're more humble. That's false humility. Because not all humility is aligned to truth. She says you shall heal the sick. You shall raise the dead. Who really does it? By what power do we do it? By the power of God. But he wants you to own the miracle. So we are changing the world. Say I'm a world changer. I am a wonder. I am a miracle worker. I am wisdom. I am intelligence. I am glory. I am peace. I am strength. I am victory. Why? Because God wants you to participate and even have an ownership in the miracle. I'm a miracle. I'm a miracle. Are you the miracle? Oh, it's God in you who is the miracle. No, I am a miracle. <laughs> You understand what I'm saying? If it disturbs you, then you have a problem in understanding. It's not my problem. It's your problem. Because one time I told people, we're going to now heal the sick. Some old person was offended. How can they say that they're going to heal the sick? And miracles happened in that meeting. They happened. And after we healed the sick and went back home, and a report was written, they're saying that the ones who heal, by what power do they heal? 
Huh? They're supposed to be healing by the power of God. They're supposed to say that in the name of Jesus. No, it's already in the name. <laughs> but they don't have understanding that we're doing these things. He says, in my name you shall cast out devils. And you know what some people think? Some people think that for you to cast out a devil, you have to say, in the name of Jesus, go. So if you don't say in the name of Jesus, by what name are you? <laughs> oh my God. No, you walk to the devil. You don't even need to say in the name because he knows you come in that name. You tell it, get out of her. And it will come out. It will come out. Because we have the understanding. We have the understanding. The Son of Man says, has come to give us an understanding that we are in Him. That's the understanding. That is the understanding. That we know Him who is true. And that we are in Him that is true. Even Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And the Amplified Bible says, that man is the true God. That man, he says, is the true God. That man is the true God. This man, he says, is the true God. How dare you call a man God? God has no problem in you being called God. No, 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 you don't get it. I don't have a problem in my child saying that I'm Lubega. Do you get it? How can I cut a wife if my child says, I am Lubega? How can you call yourself my name? Hey, wait a minute. That's my seed. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He says, ye are gods. Ye are gods and children of the Most High. But he says, but you shall die and fall like one of the princes. You shall die like one of the princes. How should you die like men? I refuse to die like a man. I refuse to die like a predictable sort. I refuse to die of the things that are killing people. Uh, 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 uh. That's not my testimony. I'm a God. And then they say that they are God. I'm a God. What do you want me to do? Hallelujah. Glory to God. But it's understanding. It's understanding. So he tells Moses, and this is an old covenant. If God can be this crazy about us in the old, what about the new? And so we see, he's saying, you stretch out your hand over the sea that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians. You stretch your hand. You pray. You speak. You command it. But God, send fire. No, you command that fire to come. You'll see what I'll do if you're ready to believe me. And this is the mystery of faith. And Moses 27 says, stretched forth his hand over the sea and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared and the Egyptians fled against it and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. That's how it happened. Back to this, by faith. Let's emphasize this for a second. By faith. They went through or crossed the Red Sea as though on dry land. As though on dry land. It wasn't dry land. It wasn't dry land. It was as though it was dry land. But it wasn't dry land. Because seas have no dry lands. Hallelujah, glory to God. And that's what kills the Egyptian. Now I'm prophesying. God told me to tell somebody that I'm about to create a situation that will drown those that pursue you. You might have an incurable disease, but I can create a degree of heat where that virus can't live, where that bacteria can't live, or protozoa. And when you're through it, the virus will be dead. The bacteria will be there, but you'll still be alive. I'm making a way where there seems to be no way. He's saying, I'm going to put an event in a few coming days, a few months from now, a few weeks from now, that is going to shake things. And that very event will overwhelm your enemy. But he says, but you shall come out glorious. You shall come out triumphant. May you have the wisdom and grace to understand that when that event came, it was not because you had done anything bad. It was not because you had done anything wrong. But it was because it was the only way I would swallow those that oppose you. It was the only way I would sink those that are against you. It was the only way I would overwhelm those that have set themselves against you. Did he not say in the book of Psalms, and they that pursue you shall go to the path of darkness 
and it shall be slippery for them. In the places where your feet shall be established, your enemy shall step and slide. In the places where your paths are clear and full of light, your enemy shall step and it shall become dark for them. And when God sees you through, truly they shall all say that that man had a God, has a God. That woman has a God. Ignore those that are pursuing you. Don't pray against them. Don't speak against them. Don't fight them. Exodus 14, 14, he says, I shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Don't fight if you want God to fight for you. Don't hold your hand up if you want God to fight for you. I want you to raise your hands right now and speak to God. Let us just receive that word. Just get it in your spirit. Conceive it and say, it is mine for the taking. Just raise your voice. Korebo Sharamando Rubrosere Boko Sharababa Shobakata Mando Robose Boko Shiraba. Raise your voice and receive this word. Receive it in your spirit. Receive it in your heart. Conceive it in your mind and say it is mine. Koraba Zobosha. Come on, pray. This prayer is personal. It is personal, whether it is disease that has been disturbing you, whether it's bondage or poverty of strife, or you've been having trouble at your work, or whether you're under attack as a minister innocently, or whether you're under whatever, just raise your voice and speak to God. I feel that whatever is coming ahead of you, you shall go through, but it shall overwhelm your enemy. Just raise your voice and speak. Whether you're going through whatever an attack of your marriage, God is doing something in your life that will overwhelm the devil, 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 that will overwhelm the devil. I've already said it, the devil can fight hard, but he cannot fight long. Thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph and he maketh manifest the servant of his knowledge by us in every place. Oh, when mountains fall, I'll stand by the power of your hand and in your heart of hearts outweigh that my soul knows very well hold me quiet you make your face you make your face to shine on me that my soul knows very well you lift me up and cleansed and free that my soul knows very well when mountains fall I'll stay by the power of your hand and in your heart of hearts I'll pray that my soul knows very My soul knows very well Forgiveness, hope I know is mine Is mine Then my soul knows very well When mountains fall I'll stay
that my soul knows very well. So I speak peace in your houses. I speak strength in your life. I rebuke fear out of your life. And I decree and I declare that you'll go through this. But it shall overwhelm that which fights you. The power of God is available to redeem, to fill all gaps and change all circumstances. And this is your word that you might walk therein in the mighty name of Jesus. If you've never given your life to Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. The Bible says he shed his blood for you. He shed his blood for you. He shed his blood for you. He is a propitiation of our sins, not only for us as believers, but the Bible says, but for the whole world. So he died for everybody. The Bible says there's no name that is named in heaven or earth or anywhere by which men are saved, save the name of Jesus Christ. And so, if you want to believe Christ tonight, I just want you to repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins and was raised for my glory. I believe you're the Son of God who is coming back for me. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 41 466 4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest. <laughs>